Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge. I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Our group promotes the advancement of social capital theories and we support anyone who uses the concept in, in research and practical application. And we have members from over 130 different countries. We have a, an active discussion group with over a thousand members and, and we hold regular webinars from invited speakers and, and PhD students. In this session, we welcome Professor Joseph Lewandowski for a presentation and discussion about social capital and sport. Professor Lewandowski is an educator, researcher and author whose work focuses on sport, social capital and inequality in the urban melee. Uh, the former holder of the Fulbright Masaryk Dis Distinguished Chair in Social Studies, Lewandowski currently serves as Professor of Philosophy at the University of Central Missouri. He is also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of the Philosophy of Sport and a working group fellow at the Legatum Institute. Among his many publications on social capital theory, Lewandowski is the author of Sport, Trust and Social Capital, co-editor of Trust and Transitions, Social Capital in a Changing World, and more recently, Urban Social Capital, Civic Society and City Life. Welcome and over to you, Joseph. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tristan. And I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. I know for some of you, it's quite, quite early. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just uh, get started directly. It sounds like we're going to hold our questions to the end. Uh, my talk is basically divided into four parts. Um, I have the kind of outline set up here. I begin with, a, with an introduction, essentially, to my own personal and professional journey in social capital theory and research. Um, believe it or not, it's been 20 years uh, since I've been working on this topic on and off. And then we'll go into um, an attempt to kind of develop a typology of uh, social capital theory. And from there, move into a discussion of Putnam and the, the a bit of scrutinizing or critique of Putnam's conception of bridging social capital in particular. Then we'll zoom back out and, and talk a bit more about how best to conceive of social capital and what we're actually talking about, and then make explicit the link to, to sport, um, followed by a summary and a, a brief discussion. So um, let me just make a start here and uh, we will get, uh, get going. So basically, I mean, I think one of the things that draws us all to social capital studies and social capital theory um, is its interdisciplinarity, right? We, we, we know that this is a very rich conception and that it pulls from many, many different disciplines. This is nothing, nothing new. The interdisciplinarity is, uh, is part of its strength, but it's also, in my view, part of its weakness. It leads to a lot of uh, a vagueness and um, um, some, some sloppy conceptualization and some empirical confusions, I would say. Um, the other thing that we're drawn to, again, uh, social capital theory for is its broad empirical relevance. So whether it's studying sporting associations or ma uh, many of the venues, all of the venues of civil society, um, diverse as they are, social capital seems to be flexible enough and capable of stretching to cover uh, many different uh, locations of social life. Uh, what draws me to it in particular, in addition to these things, is there's, a, in my view, a critical potential of social capital to explain not simply the glue uh, of social life, not just simply the things that hold us together, but also uh, the things that divide us, uh, the, what I call the friction of social life. So social capital has this uh, dual function, and some of that will come out in my, in my talk today. Um, my basic view is that social capital should be used as a, as a concept to critique society and to try and understand how we might uh, reconfigure it uh, more productively. The, the first thing that you confront, and I think we all could agree on this, uh, when, you, when you enter this field um, and when you work in it uh, for decades, is what you might call, or what might call the problem of definitions. So what are we talking about when we use this phrase? How are we to conceptualize it? And how are we to, to apply it? That was something that confronted me 20 years ago when I started to work in this, this area. With a background in social and political philosophy, um, I wanted to begin uh, studying transition societies, in particular post-communist countries. And one of the things I was interested in was 
what made these transitions work uh, to market-based societies um, and to democracy. So social capital research and social capital work was of interest to me. So I went from a kind of a interest in definitions to kind of the political dimensions of social capital theory and then the sociological ones. And today I'm working more in what you might call the normative or the philosophical aspects. So all these will come through in the discussion today. Um, the, the first question I kind of tried to work through in my work and Tristan was referencing it uh, uh, earlier is what are we talking about when we say social capital? And uh, one of the things I tried to argue was that it might make more sense to talk about social capital in terms of sociability, which will be a, a, a focus of my talk today, and its capitalization. So this was a, a work of mine in 2006, and it's something I will um, kind of bring out again in my talk today. Uh, the second thing I started to think about, especially in my engagement with social capital and democracy, uh, was questioning the relationship, the causal relationship between social capital and democracy. Um, does social capital democratize or is indeed the reverse, that social capital is in need of democratization? Um, networks and norms can become closed very quickly and social capital can be, become a resource um, used in strategic uh, engagements with one another at the class level. Uh, and then the last thing I, I started to work in terms of definitions was thinking of poverty differently. Social capital helped to inspire me to think about um, poverty, not just in a material sense, but in a social sense, um, a paucity or a dearth of networks and connections um, and relations of trust. So all this will come out in the discussion today. And this is just kind of an, a long-winded way of saying that definitions are crucial. And um, I began my journey through social capital through thinking about definitions in social capital theory. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the first set of questions I tried to address in, in, my, in my first book co-edited with colleagues from the Czech Republic was, what role does trust in social capital more generally play in post-communist transition societies? So we know um, after these revolutions in, the, in 89 and early 90s that uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, moved to market-based democracies it, at different paces. And part of the reason for that, it was argued or suggested, was based on trust and social capital levels in those societies and the damage done to that by communism. So this was the kind of the first um, set of questions I worked through and brought me into the field, as it were, in an empirical sense. Um, I've also had a longstanding interest in um, urban studies and uh, context of ethno-racial complexity and socioeconomic division. And so my kind of second phase in social capital work might be called sociological, loosely again, um, but this idea that, uh, is there something unique about social capital in the urban milieu, in the urban context, where we have high levels of ethno-racial complexity and diversity and lots of stratification going on, ethno-racially, and socioeconomically. That's something that will come through today in my, my talk as well. Uh, this I added with a colleague in political science at my home institution. And here's where I started to lay out in more detail a concept of social poverty, which I will also uh, reference during this uh, talk. Today, these days, I've focused more on sport and um, more particularly the, what you might call the normative relationship between sport and social capital, pursuing questions. Well, the basic question is, the sport associations and does engagement in sport foster something like democracy or habits of democracy or forms of social cooperation? Um, what is the relationship between sport and social capital? The, Discussion of definitions of social capital led me to kind of group things in three, three strands or three bundles, as it were. And of course, this is, these are imperfect categories. There's always overlap. But basically, in my early work, and I still kind of use this framework, and so I wanted to introduce my own work um, in discussion today uh, by drawing on this, is uh, in my view, these different uh, conceptions of social capital can be loosely grouped in three, three strands or three, three areas. One would be kind of 
the economic or rational approach, the one we all know or most familiar probably through Coleman. Um, the second would be the Marxist or what I might call the, what I do call the critical approach. And the third is the democratic or political um, approach. I'm going to be focusing on Putnam in this talk, but I do have an interest in all three and I'm happy to discuss those um, as we get to the um, end of the presentation. The, uh, the economic strand uh, in social capital theory uh, is really one in which there are assumptions made about individual actors as rational choice makers. It's called the rationality assumption. And basically the idea is that people are utility maximizers and social capital plays a role in our utility maximization. Uh, ultimately, social capital is a strategic resource and I emphasize the word strategic here in the individual pursuits, pursuit of the realization of choices um, and uh, objectives and preferences. Uh, I won't cite, I, I put the quotation in here. I don't, certainly don't need to read this, but are we all, we're all quite familiar with Coleman's work, I'm sure. And this is kind of one of the key quotations um, that I think serve as an organizing principle for, the, for what I'm calling the economic strand. The Marxist strand views things a bit differently. Um, this is not just about disembedded actors making rational choices, but humans as situated or embedded in a, sometimes it's called a background or a habitus or a context even. Uh, and this way of thinking about social capital, and this one is somewhat closer to my the view I hold, uh, social capital amounts to a kind of stratified and stratifying resource in conflicts, continual conflicts and clashes between and among individuals who are understood as members of groups. And these conflicts and clashes are not um, uh, um, neutral or random. They involve uh, the pursuit of positions of ascendancy. So essentially class conflict and class uh, division. Uh, the Bourdieu quote um, comes from an essay called Forms of Capital in 1968. I have put a bibliography at the end of this presentation for folks um, to, to find these uh, references if they're not familiar with them. But I do want to highlight one thing in this particular quotation here in the third bullet, the way in which uh, Bourdieu thinks of social capital as a credit or a kind of credential um, that can be cashed out in terms of group affiliation and pursuit of domination. The third strand and the one I think probably many of our viewers are, what, what brought many of our viewers to social capital theory, certainly it's what brought me to social capital theory is, is Putnam's way of thinking about social capital and in particular the, the landmark study uh, Bowling Alone. Um, in this case, uh, humans are understood not simply as um, disembedded rational choice maximizers or embedded kind of um, context dependent uh, members of a habitus, uh, but probably more broadly as uh, intersubjective agents. Um, human beings uh, uh, pursue relationships with one another in different ways, and in doing that, they cultivate shared habits of thinking and doing together. Um, in this line, in this strand, as it were, uh, social capital constitutes uh, a crucial normative resource. Uh, in social cohesion, character building, civic virtue, and even to borrow Putnam's phrase, making, uh, making democracy work. I do want to quote this line from Putnam. Of course, we're all familiar with these, but again, social, Putnam, uh, quote, uh, social capital greases the wheels that allow communities to advance smoothly and helps to develop or maintain, maintain character traits that are good for the rest of society. So this is basically a way of understanding the um, normative effects, normative effects of human actions, um, uh, and the ways in which uh, social relations cultivate a certain, uh, uh, a certain, almost a certain morality, a certain orientation to self and other. I'm going to kind of set the table here for the critical part of the discussion in which I turn my attention to Putnam's um, discussion of 
bridging social capital. Um, Putnam's presented uh, uh, a kind of brief typology of, of social capital in terms of bonding and bridging. Bonding, as we all know, is the kind of exclusive form of social capital on Putnam's view. It's the one that tends to reinforce exclusive identities and homogeneous groups uh, and, quote, bolsters our, nar our narrow selves um, and serves as a kind of sociological superglue. Bridging, on the other hand, uh, is inclusive on Putnam's view. It's outward looking and, quote, encompasses people across diverse social cleavages. This is something I'm going to um, uh, ask some uh, critical questions about in the, in the later stages of the presentation. Uh, again, bridging social capital, quote, generates broader identities and reciprocity, a sociological WD-40. I'm always curious if people know what WD-40 is all around the world. Um, it's, a, it's a type of machine lubricant uh, in the US. I know it's widely available. I don't know that I've seen it in Europe and I don't know if it's available elsewhere. I always wonder if people pause over that uh, description. Um, but in any case, um, this kind of um, super glue and this uh, sociological lubricant of these two, two types of social capital. The bridging social capital uh, that Putnam um, uh, highlights plays a crucial role in his theory, and I don't want us to overlook it um, or minimize it. Um, he really does think, and he really does suggest repeatedly that bridging social capital uh, has democratic effects. Um, internally, social capital, quote, uh, instills, quote, habits of cooperation and public spiritedness among diverse individuals. So it has an effect on your your kind of character and the open-mindedness of your um, uh, of your orientation to the world, um, but externally, social capital multiplies and amplifies. A uh, bridging social capital multiplies and amplifies what Putnam calls the quiet voices of civil society. So it has this multiplier in amplifying uh, effect. Uh, in some. Um, uh, bridging social capital fosters democratic habits of individuals and the collective actions of the larger polity. So, so far so good. I think we all know this uh, and uh, are familiar with this. And this has become a kind of truism even in social capital theory that um, the right kind of social capital can lead to a more democratic way of life. This next section, I want to kind of switch gears and move away from typologies and uh, summaries to, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, a kind of scrutiny or critique of the notion of bridging social capital. And I want to do it through some kind of uh, historical analysis as well. So we know the, the, the basic thesis of bowling alone and here we'll also kind of provide our uh, entree into theory of sport and ways to think about sport. We know the overarching thesis of the, of the landmark study is that um, team bowling uh, required us, required um, people um, to trans, quote, transcend their social and political and professional identities and to connect with people unlike themselves. In other words, the idea was in the, in the study, the sport of bowling functions inclusively and that bowling together fosters bridging, uh, bridging social capital. By contrast, right, and this was the kind of the, uh, the alarm bell that uh, social capital, uh, that um, bowling alone uh, sounded. Um, by contrast, bowling alone, when Americans start to bowl alone, and the rise of solo bowling contributes to and expresses the demise of bridging social capital and consequently the beginning of the end of community and democracy in America. As I said, I want to think a bit about the historical accuracy of this 
narrative of uh, narrative of decline in uh, stores of social capital as reflected in the demise of bowling bowling leagues in the U.S. So just a few kind of historical facts about the ethno-racial history of bowling in the U.S. Um, bowling alleys and leagues, like many uh, venues of civil society in the U.S., were highly segregated under Jim Crow laws. And they remained that way for many, many years thereafter in the de facto uh, segregation that followed. As a matter of fact, bowling uh, and many other sports and venues of civil society in the U.S. reflected and augmented a kind of apartheid, social apartheid, in many sectors of American society, including those of sport and civil society more, more generally. The fact is, uh, Black and Brown Americans bowled in basements, um, while white Americans bowled in what we would consider proper bowling alleys. Wonderful account of this in a work by Sheldon in 2016. The, the, the main bowling organization in America, the American Bowling Congress, excluded Black Americans until 1951. Um, Black Americans formed their own league in 1939. It was initially known as the National Negro Bowling Association. And today, uh, today it's known uh, as the National Bowling Association, the TNBA. They have a website and some of the data I'll be giving you on the next slide comes from that, comes from that website. The TNBA today has about 30,000 members. Uh, 115 affiliates in the U.S. and Bermuda. Well over 80% of the members identify as African American. What does this tell us? Um, what this tells us is that bowling together in the U.S. Um, is historically segregated by ethno-racial identity. It has been and it continues to be. Um, participation in the sport of bowling in the U.S. did not and still does not appear to foster anything like bridges that diversify communities and democratize like worlds. Uh, in fact, the opposite seems to be the case. Rather than bridging social capital in the sport of bowling, what we see uh, in the history and the present of bowling in the U.S is the emergence of what Marion Orr calls black social capital. And I'll be talking about that in a bit, a bit, uh, bit later in the presentation. So what we don't see in the ethno-racial history of bowling in the US is the production of a type of bridging social capital that connects um, folks unlike one another. What we see is a type of social capital that links folks who are already um, pretty much like themselves. So I think the best way to, and this was almost the title of my talk, or one of the options, uh, Bowling Together in America, question mark. Um, Sport-based associations um, such as bowling, associational forms such as bowling together, it cannot easily or readily be said to transcend durable histories and practices of ethno-racial stratification uh, and enclosure, right? They don't cut across um, the histories of segregation and ghettoization uh, in American life or indeed many societies uh, in ways that connect individuals to others unlike themselves. In fact, um, um, on the contrary here, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, social capital cultivated in bowling in the U.S. tended to foster and continues to tend to foster and augment and reinforce historical and existing forms of stratification and uh, segregation. So people may have been bowling together during the golden era of vibrant civil society that Putnam alludes to, 
but they were bowling with folks more or less like themselves. So here I wanna kind of shift gears a bit uh, and think more about social capital and the role of the social and sport in terms of sociability uh, and um, see if we can come up with a more robust way to connect social capital theorizing to, to sport. I do think there's a role for social capital um, uh, theorizing to play in discussions of sport. And I have been working on those in my own work. I'm not convinced that they um, uh, should follow the lead of Putnam and um, borrow too heavily on the account of bridging social capital. Sociability is uh, a term um, you find in um, uh, uh, German sociology. Geselligkeit is the term in German, translated as association or the term I'm using today, sociability. Geselligkeit is basically forms of highly reflexive interaction, social co cooperation and collaboration. Uh, Zimmel, Georg Zimmel is the kind of, uh, 20th century, early 20th century German sociologist who kind of develops the account of sociability that I'm working from. Uh, he says, quote, sociability is the play form of association. Riches in social position, learning and fame have no role in sociability. So these are forms of repeated social interaction, um, largely stripped of their um, social positioning and um, class positions and privileges. Examples of sociability include um, uh, art, dance, games, and sport. Uh, one of the easiest ways to think about sociability in my mind is to think of the phrase, it takes two to tango. Uh, the tango is, uh, in my view, a paradigmatic example of sociability. Uh, there, no two, if there's no two, there's no tango. And the two who tango have to have mastered the art of sociability, complex, forms of social cooperation and collaboration. Comp both competition and teamwork depend upon successful cultivation of social cooperation and collaboration. Um, uh, and uh, Zimmel, I think, helps point the way towards or at least lay the foundation for an account of sociability in sport. Uh, I did want to read this, this quote uh, from his um, uh, early writings on sociability. Uh, all these associations, sport, games, art, and so on, are accompanied by a satisfaction, the very, fa very fact that one is associated with others and that the solitariness of the individual is resolved into togetherness. So I think what I'm uh, what I'm trying to suggest and what I've been trying to suggest in my work um, for the last decade or so is it, it makes more sense and it's more accurate empirically and normatively to think of sport not so much as tied to social capital and as a transmission belt of social capital production, but as a site of sociability. Um, Participation in athletics, whether it's a team sport like bowling or an individual sport like boxing, which is one of the areas I work on in terms of sport, entails persistent engagements in sites of sociability, right? So gyms and bowling alleys uh, are sites of mutual competition and repeated cooperative and collaborative actions, especially in training um, and scrimmages, friendly matches and so on. So there is, um, uh, something to sport and the social that is akin to social capital, but it's in some sense prior to it. And that's what I want to try and begin to suggest or work out here. Uh, but before we get there, we do need to think of sociability in terms of horizontal and vertical, horizontality and verticality. So in my account, there's something like horizontal sociability and something like vertical sociability. Let me say a few things about each of these. 
and make sure this the distinction between these and bridging and bonding social capital is is clear. So horizontal sociability. Um, by the way, I do think what I have to say about um, sociability and sport applies to other venues of civil society. Um, um, and so I hope in our discussion, we can try and extend this, this account out a bit um, to, to other areas. But uh, um, sociability in the way I'm thinking of it here, um, horizontally, sporting sites of horizontal sociability are largely accessible and appropriable, appropriable by individuals from within a specific ethno-racial socioeconomic and or cultural stratum. So this is a kind of the homogeneous form of sociability in sport um, where individuals engage with others more or less like themselves. And this is in fact the most commonplace form of sociability in sport. Elite sports like fencing and polo draw folks from a certain level um, uh, or stratum in society. Uh, and those folks um, are drawn to those sports in part because of the relationship between their, their privilege and their um, socioeconomic background uh, and identity and the resonance that sport has uh, for them. Um, so, so sociability in sport, generally speaking, is folks more like themselves, folks more or less like one another um, participating in sport and playing together on teams and competing. This is the most common, common form of sociability in sport. There is, however, um, and by contrast, a place for thinking about the vertical form of sociability in sport. Um, vertical sociability uh, is largely accessible and appropriate by individuals from up and down existing ethno-racial, socioeconomic, and or cultural strata. So in this, this uh, uh, form of sociability, uh, on my account, individuals engage with others, capital O, more or less unlike themselves. So this seems to be what bridging social capital and Putnam's account of bowling implied, but in fact, we know from the ethnic racial history of bowling and the current makeup of bowling uh, in the US um, was not the case. Um, this is the exceptional form of sociability in sport. This is the one you don't see very often. Uh, and this is the one kind of, for me, that is the most interesting and also the, the most elusive. Sociability in sport, and I would argue in other venues of civil society, may or may not be harnessed or capitalized by individuals in ways to produce social capital. So what I'm suggesting is social capital is the, the byproduct or the intentional harnessing or capitalizing of sociability and support. And it may or may not happen. Individuals could cultivate different forms of sociability, horizontal or vertical, and it may never leave, leave the gym um, or the pitch. Uh, the capitaliz capitalization of horizontal sociability is the most common one, right? This is the one that produces a stratified resource for individual and collective action within a given socioeconomic and or ethno-racial level. So you, know, you belong to a fencing club or a polo club and what you acquire there in Bordeaux sense is a kind of credit that gives you further status and place within the uh, elite level you find yourself socioeconomically or ethno-racially. So it's a way of advancing, securing, and establishing a credit for your privilege. Capitalization of vertical sociability um, is the far less um, typical one. Uh, this produces a kind of de-stratifying resource for individual and collective action up and down diverse socioeconomic and or ethno-racial levels. My colleague and I in political science um, did a study of um, local churches and synagogues and mosques in a city near us 
Um, and it was a textbook case of, ca of capital creating and capitalizing vertical sociability. What you had was um, interfaith alliances um, between and among and across and up and down these um, um, stratified religious groups. Um, and uh, it produced a certain type of social capital that was quite rare, um, uh, where you had Episcopalians and um, members of the lo local mosque, all kind of forming an alliance in the interest of urban, urban renewal. So this kind of thing can happen, this capitalization of vertical sociability, but it is quite, quite um, uncommon. Um, and then social poverty, which I alluded to at the beginning of the, uh, of the talk, um, is essentially the absence or scarcity of vertical social capital. So go back to the formation of what Marion Orr calls black social capital um, in Bowling in the US or even urban school reform movements in the US, we see this in different contexts. Um, what you have is you have um, uh, a formation of social relations that can be activated um, in social movements, for example, but they lose power and efficacy because they are only um, formed by and held by folks from marginalized or non-dominant groups. And so they might be rich in terms of relations, um, but their, uh, um, their efficacy uh, and their power is impoverished because of their position in the socioeconomic ethno-racial hierarchy. We're seeing some of that in the, the Black Lives Matter movement here in the US today. Initially, these were, um, uh, this was a movement um, that caught the attention of white American liberals and uh, involved a kind of vertical capitalization of social relations, uh, ethno-racially. But as time has gone on, uh, white Americans have largely exited the Black Lives Movement, uh, the Black, Black Lives Matter movement and what we see is um, a weakening of the um, political and social bite and normative bite of that, of that a very important, uh, important movement. In my own work and uh, others as well, uh, uh, boxing gyms um, have proven to be surprisingly rich sites of sociability. Um, the sport, Interestingly enough, fosters both horizontal, what I've called horizontal and vertical forms of sociability. Um, socioeconomically horizontal, in so far as the sport draws together mainly working class men and women, boxing has a long tradition uh, of uh, drawing working class folks, uh, folks who are used to using their bodies. Um, and who are uh, have a kind of um, uh, laboring ethos. Uh, this is a type of a sport boxing that uh, requires kind of a daily grind for any success at all. Uh, presence in the gym, uh, boxers look at themselves as going to work and as think of it as a job, even kind of mediocre ones and ones whose talents will not take them very far. The sport is truly a um, as the rhythms and routines of the proletariat. So socioeconomically, boxing gyms for the most part, sites of horizontal um, uh, sociability. Ethno-racially, interestingly enough, uh, boxing gyms have uh, our sites of vertical sociability. The sport and combat sports in general and um, sports that depend a lot on the body. Um, uh, uh, tend to bring together individuals from up and down various racial, racial hierarchies. Um, my work in uh, ethnographic work in a boxing gym in the city where I live, um, essentially saw the, the members of the gym split into three groups, ethno-racial, uh, ethno white American, black, African-American, and uh, um, Hispanic, Latino. So the, uh, the, the, the thing to think about or the takeaway on um, thinking about sociability in sport, especially in contrast to bridging social capital in sport, 
is that we need to avoid what I've called in my work, the, uh, the moral inflationism uh, of the democratic strand and social capital theorizing, and particularly Putnam and people who follow Putnam. There's, there's no, we should be guarded in, in our thinking and in our claims. There's no necessary transcend, transcendent external or democratizing effect to participation in sport. Um, bowling alone, bowling together, uh, neither one of these um, had any real effect on um, the democratization and the diversification of ethno-racial -re ethno relations in the US. Um, folks bowled with folks like themselves and still do. Of course, that's not to say that sport is morally trivial. Uh, that would be uh, uh, a mistake. Uh, sport can and does function as a site um, for the cultivation of sociability, uh, reflexive social cooperation, collaboration, both horizontally and vertically. And it's an empirical question which sports cultivate which types of um, uh, sociability, horizontal or vertical. It's also an empirical question, the extent to which those forms of sociability get capitalized and turned into uh, social capital and cashed out and move outside of the venue of sport. That's something I think we can talk about in the discussion. Um, but in the end, it's uh, to make a long story short, it's a, it's a mistake to think of sport um, as serving as a school of democracy or as causally related to making democracy work. These are, this is a normative inflation or moral inflation of the, of the functions of sport um, in, in a stratified contemporary modern society. So I've been talking for quite a while and I do want to allow for some discussion. So let me briefly summarize what I've been saying here and um, then turn it over to Tristan to moderate the conversation or however we want to do the, uh, the discussion. So after kind of tracing my own kind of professional and personal um, journey through social capital theory, um, I began with identifying three strands in social capital work. Again, these are uh, generalizations designed to help orient the conversation. And I think they're helpful as well for folks who are in the early stages of work in social capital theory. Uh, it's important to think about where you stand in the landmark of definitions. And it's important to tackle and address the, what I've called the problem of definition in social capital and social capital research. Um, myself, my own work is probably a fusion of interest in the normative dimensions, kind of following Putnam, but then developing a kind of critical view of that and an awareness of the uh, class based stratifying elements of social relations and hierarchies. Uh, the second move in the, in the presentation was essentially uh, the argument. Um, looking at Putnam's uh, bowling alone and, and the normative claims made there, and contrasting that with the ethno-racial history of bowling in the US, um, I suggested that it's not evident at all that participation in the sport of bowling uh, generates bridging social capital in Putnam's sense. And it's still not evident to this day. Uh, from there, I moved into an account of sociability, which I find in my own work to be a more productive way to think about social capital uh, and um, uh, its uh, applications. I identified two types of sociability, horizontal and vertical, in the discussion of uh, sport in particular. Uh, I think it's incumbent on us to get the definitions right when it comes to social capital. And one way to start to tackle that, at least in my work, has been to develop a somewhat alternative account of sociability and its capitalization. Bowling then, uh, kind of look at the, the sport connection. Uh, bowling then, like most sports, 
uh, should be understood and taken to, to, to function primarily as a site of horizontal sociability. Uh, sport does not escape the stratification of social life. And it's not a place to look to do that um, particularly easily or readily. Boxing, ironically and interesting enough, and unlike most sports, does serve as both a site of horizontal and vertical sociability. Having said that, however, um, we should avoid the next step, um, the inflationary moral causal step of suggesting that participation in sport um, produces something like bridging social capital in um, Putnam sense and might foster sociability, but it's an open question the extent to which type of sociability that is and how it's cashed out or if it's cashed out outside of the venue of, of sport. I've included a bibliography of the works referenced in this brief presentation for your uh, for your reference. I'm sure some of them are familiar to you, some others may not be. Uh, so I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And with that, I will turn things over to Tristan for some discussion and uh, further analysis. Well, thanks very much, Joseph. There's certainly a, a lot of questions that have come up in the chat. So uh, we've got quite a lot of material to, to work our way through. Um, how much time do you have for answering questions? Do we have 90 minutes? Uh, yeah, close. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, well, I might start with the first question and we'll, we'll work our way through a lot of these other questions that are, that are in the chat. Um, it seems like from my experience in sport, and I've thought about this a little bit before and written about it as well in, in some of my work, that, uh, you know, I played cricket and within different cricket teams, you often saw, you know, some teams had a lot of, uh, you know, horizontal sociability, whereas other teams had a lot of vertical sociability clearly going on within the team. Um, for example, I, I played in a team near the, uh, the University of Queensland in Brisbane that had people from a wide range of different backgrounds, uh, socioeconomically, as well as racially, culturally, religiously, and so forth. And that was a really interesting team to play mm -hmm. in a sure. part of. Whereas within the same competition, you know, playing against another team, potentially you would have people who were socioeconomically very, very similar. Um, say, you know, a team from southern Brisbane might be all sort of, you know, working class similar sort of age, similar sort of ethnicity. And so it seems like context, even within the same sport, context can play quite a significant role. Um, so it's not, I don't know if this is a question, it's, I guess it's more a reflection on how when we're doing social capital research, how we deal with the sort of the complexity of context. Right, so it's a great question and it's one I've always tried to focus on and also struggled with. Um, and it's kind of partially the motivation for thinking about urban social capital is the idea that context matters and context is going to shape the social relations of a sport or uh, a religion or any other venue of social life. So we have to factor that in. Humans are embedded agents. I do think Bourdieu and the Marxist strain has that right. Um, we're not free of context and nor are our social relations. Having said that, um, we don't just simply reflect our stratified context. So to take the boxing gym, I can't say, for example, in cricket, but to take the boxing gym where I trained for many years, um, the, the, uh, the tensions and divisions between and among and the hierarchies of ethno-racial ethno -racial relations in the US really did not find a place in the gym. So there was an egalitarian kind of ethos to the, that site. That's part of what made, made it an interesting site of sociability and a verticalizing one. Um, so, uh, I mean, context matters, but context can't be everything. Um, I, I'm always leery of and have worked to reject in my work kind of the reduction of society, of social relations to context. Humans are shaped by them, and so are relations, but they can't be reduced to them. Right. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, you're just talking about sport as a fun functionalist, in a functionalist sense, as reflecting the divisions and the, uh, um, the conflict of, of society. But sport is, at least in sport, the case of sport, sport is unique in that it 
is is of the of the existing context and yet somehow uh, doesn't transcend it but allows us to reconfigure it differently in the interest of the sport or competition or teamwork or mutual betterment yeah and perhaps a follow-up question um I'm, I'm often asked you know the the what's typically called the normative approach to social capital like you're saying it often focuses on uh, bonding and bridging distinctions which often focuses on uh network structures or homogeneity and heterogeneity of, of, of socioeconomic characteristics demographic characteristics and so forth and so i'm sometimes asked well it's, it's called the normative approach but where do norms actually come into that sort of uh you know uh, perspective yeah well i mean the norms are produced in the oh, twofold the norms are norms can be produced within the within the venue we're talking about. So sport, for example, um, participation sport produces norms and respect for rules and uh, pursuit of excellence um, that may be part of the wider society, but may also be um, in contrast to it. So I mean, so norms are both, it's not going to be a, um, um, an either or kind of response. It's not going to get a dualist response to norms, kind of internal, external won't answer the question in my view. It's the interaction of text and context, agent and agent and habitus. Uh, I'm a, I'm a non-dualist when it comes to those types of questions. So, so norms are emergent in that sense. They are both made and in the process of being made, making made. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good way to approach it. Um, I guess I'm concerned that a lot of people who take that approach, the, the normative approach, you know, looking at bonding and bridging social capital, don't necessarily have the same sort of philosophical basis as you do for how they understand the, the, the nature of their research. Yeah, I mean, this kind of, I didn't mention at the beginning of the talk, but this does also kind of reflect my own, it could be an advantage or a shortcoming, but I, I, I started my interest in social capital theory in part with an interest in philosophy of action and theories of action. And I still think, and this talk has really helped me think about it and see it again, I still think social capital theories are dependent upon assumptions about individual action and about collective action. And until you work through those and think about them and their relationship to context, which is part of the problem of action is always context. There's no context for the action. Um, it's hard to get clear on the kinds of questions you're, you just asked. So, so un unfortunately it slows things down because <laughs> the, it's, it's a comp it, it, it adds a, an additional layer of complexity to the conversation. But I do think it's important if these things are gonna have empirical, empirical bite and empirical relevance is to get these, get these uh, the theories and the assumptions correct and it's make it made explicit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we do need to spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, as social capital researchers, we need to spend a bit of time thinking about these kinds of things, because, you know, I think Ben Fine's criticism of social capital is that there isn't really any sort of theoretical foundation for it. And so, you know, we're making sort of wild empirical claims about different things without really understanding what's going on underneath, because we haven't spent that time, like you're saying, like, sort of thinking about the the theory of action that actually underpins what it is that we're we're observing and we're we're analyzing in our research so i don't want to monopolize the the conversation here i know there's a lot of other questions i think it's a big topic that we could spend quite a lot of time um, getting into and exploring just want to move on to the next question uh, joseph would you mind uh, dropping out of the screen share so that we can see each other a little more oh yeah sure i didn't realize i had done that so that's all right uh, so I just want to, um, first of all, like, uh, that better? yep, that's great. Thank you. Um, just want to have a look at a, a question that came from somebody uh, before the presentation, uh, Ramat Shazi, who's in, in Malaysia. He asks, after measuring the levels of social capital, um, how do we use that data to guide our interventions in assisting, for example, soccer teams? So uh, that's, that's a, I appreciate the question in several respects. One, soccer, football is a global sport and um, there's lots of work on kind of community and social capital building through sport. Um, and my first kind of thought there is thinking a little bit about, are we talking about so soccer teams, we're talking about youth soccer. The level of the sport matters for the conversation. Um, if we're talking about youth soccer, youth boxing clubs and so on, um, 
our objective is clearly not necessarily to produce um, excellent uh, competitors. Our, our, our sport has an explicit social function. My view is sports like football or soccer and boxing are rich sites for social capital cultivation and vertical sociability cultivation, precisely because the entry level, uh, the en economic entry level, the cost barriers are exceptionally low. So you're not talking about a sport like polo, fencing, ice hockey. Uh, these, these, these sports are places where we can self-consciously try to cultivate and draw in youth. So youth sports I'm talking about now, um, youth from a variety of socioeconomic and no racial levels. Um, but that we should keep in mind, that is uh, an exception to the rule. That is not generally how sport clubs work. Sport clubs typically just reflect and augment the socioeconomic, cultural, ethno-racial milieu they find themselves in. But there is a there is, and this is what I take to be right about community development through sport. There is a role to be played um, for sports with essentially no economic entry barrier costs um, in the cultivation of social capital, uh, but. They're, they're as much social clubs as they are athletic ones. And that's not a criticism. That's just a kind of, it's a very different thing to try and you know, open up a, a boxing gym to make money, which is difficult even under the best circumstances. And one as a kind of uh, social site for impoverished youth to learn a skill set, self-discipline and you know, help them with their homework. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm in favor. I'm in favor of the second one, obviously, but uh, but uh, that's not that's not common, and that takes a certain type of uh, uh, effort. Yeah. So that would be the way I would answer the question, and maybe it's not a direct answer, but kind of it depends what you want out of the team or the club or the sporting endeavor. Yeah, sure. So we've got quite a lot of questions. We'll see if we'll do our best to get through them. Uh, I think we'll start with Sabine. Sabine, I know you have a, a lot of questions. Do you want to start with just one to start with and we'll move through other people's questions and hopefully we'll have time to come back to your next okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Um, at first, uh, thank you for the presentation. I was just trying to tab the question and also to follow it all, like along, but my first question is you mentioned uh, that social capital is used to critique society but um, in my case i'm doing uh, research on social capital impact on public sport governance and the question is the following what is your opinion of using social capital and its impact to critique public governance and in my case public sport governance that hmm. would be the first question so when you're talking about public sport governance, give me a little bit more of an example of what you, what you mean there. Okay, so in uh, Latvian uh, case, so we have ministry and there mm -hmm. is a department of sport that is probably like the main public sport governing body uh, alongside with the like a commission within the parliament it is like higher than the ministry because in our case in Latvia we have a parliamentary republic so parliament is above the government and so and together they also try to combine all the kind of social responsibility like from the public point of view mm -hmm. and to integrate various activities uh, through uh, strategic documents, strategic policy. So, and from like, as I've been researching it also within my, not social capital, but just public sport governance in my master thesis uh, two years ago, uh, in post-Soviet like communist, communist republics, we have a lack of some kind of trust within, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, within the government. So from the social point of view. So yeah. this is uh, probably- Okay, the... so now I understand. Yeah, so that, that helps a little more context. So, yeah. so I mean, in your case, and, and this is something you might find the trust and transitions volume of mm -hmm. interest too, because these um, uh, 
government bodies, these governing agencies, especially in sport in communist times, were so distorted and propagandized that they were essentially as much a political um, function as they were a sporting one. Of course, performance in the sport was a point of pride for each country. But that was, again, just part of a political apparatus and a regime. And you're talking about, if I understand it correctly, kind of public sport as a pub, truly a public good. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, and so, I mean, there's, there's lots of things to be said about that. One is obviously how much of these uh, bodies, uh, how time is devoted to cultivating youth sport. Um, is it primarily youth sport engagement or what would you say? Uh, well, they are trying um, to like to make uh, children and youth sport the priority. But as we are a small country, we're less than two million. They are also trying to divide the attention um, from youth sport to high performance sports. So basically the Olympians. Uh, and uh, this is like the main stuff and we're like in our government as much as uh, i respect the people who work in the sport department i have met them they're trying their best within the resources they have and that's not a lot to get where to get better and to invest more in in sport but yes we are a post-soviet a communist right. mm -hmm. uh, republic and, and so you still have high levels high levels of distrust in these agencies yeah this is uh, like uh, just from a, an experience. We just this year, Latvia hosted a World Ice Hockey Championship. Uh, and it was, of course, it was socially distant. There was nobody within the arena. And for Latvians, it, it was a big tragedy because we love our ice hockey very much. But when uh, it was announced that Latvia will host uh, the championship alone, people did not know that the ministry of education and science is the one responsible for sport. So, and they said like, what, how do we know that the, the government will not sure. budge this project? So basically, yes, there is a deep, deep distrust within and the corruption within government, like yeah. pro probable uh, corruption within governmental systems or even like if people believe in it uh, also affects how people distrust the government. And so another, also... yeah, so I understand. So another, um, I don't know how robust the, um, the not-for-profit sector is there, but uh, another kind of uh, avenue for cultivating social capital through sport is through the not-for-profit sector. So uh, that, and that, that will peel, that might just kind of speculate, but that would peel the, the, uh, the power of sport and the conception of the public good of sport away from the legacy of kind of distrust, but also incompetence and corruption um, could anyway. Um, yeah. We have we have some of that here. We, we don't have a ministry of sport in, in the US um, and, uh, but we do have kind of uh, not-for-profit uh, agencies um, and sometimes those are viewed differently with higher levels of trust viewed as less politi less politicized um, and possibly more competently managed yeah uh, just a comment on how we also have a really like a high uh, amount of non-governmental organizations especially or for all federations all uh, clubs uh, sport clubs are usually non-governmental organizations NGOs and one of the like best examples how uh, non-governmental organization, uh, just a group, uh, I also mentioned in the comment about the ghetto games. Uh, they were established, at, I think at the end of the 2000s and they surround themselves and base themselves off urban sports. So basically street basketball, street football, mm -hmm. uh, everything. And through this um, like activity that is basically for youth for city youth to be active and not to do drugs or like be involved in crime they started playing basketball and from especially street basketball three x3 and this led to our national team winning olympics this year 
So, and because those four guys are so uh, down to earth and so within the like the general public, people went crazy when we won. And it's like, these are our guys. These are not some like uh, rich and, and famous. They are sure. just regular guys. And the youth and everybody started playing all of a sudden and practicing three by three. It was it was crazy, and this is like small country. And yes, and and all of a sudden, when you know the backstory of how they came to be, they came to the point where they went to the Olympics, not because of the ministry. They went through their talent. They uh, went through their grit, because it's a really brutal sport, and that's how they get got there where they are. And uh, so yes, this is. But I will definitely check out the trust and transitions. I already like written down, and uh, so there's a lot to 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 talk. Yeah, but I will leave my <laughs> the floor to other questions. But thank you for thank the you. answer. Thank you. Hey Sabine, we we might be able to come back to more of your questions. We'll just get through some yeah. other ones. Um, yeah, of course. Rick, did you want to go next? You you have a couple of questions. Sure. I mean, so. Um... One of the questions that and I have to go back up, I apologize. I was doing it as as we went. But one of the things, and I think I've I've seen it here visually. I have not done any research on it, but just to get your insight on it. So do you think that there are individuals or groups that use certain sports, like the United States, for instance, golf is a big one, to either attempt to connect to others of a higher social class than themselves or to feel like they are represented in a higher social class? Uh, than they're currently in. I mean, I, I came from a very low socioeconomic class and I see a lot of members of my class who I grew up with and know they had no interest in playing golf nor did they ever play golf. And suddenly we're adults and they're all going to play golf, uh, you know. So just, you know, if you had any insight on that. Yeah, it's great. Appreciate the question. And it, it goes back to kind of some of the points made about the Marxist strand in social capital theorizing. So this um, acquiring entry into kind of sports that maybe typically had been above one's socioeconomic level is an attempt to acquire the credit or the marker kind of Bordeauxian type terms, but to lay hold of the credit or the marker um, that will display a new type of status. Um, so in this sense, you know, getting into a golf club or owning golf clubs and then uh, joining a golf club, participating in this elite sport or this socioeconomically um, um, advantaged sport um, is a way for someone, whether they're any good at golf or not, to kind of instantly present um, the uh, kind of accoutrement or the symbolic dimensions of their status. And so people do this all the time um in and through sport um the question for me is whether or not they also then manage to acquire the level of kind of social capital or if they're still kind of outsiders even though they're through the door so to speak um sports elite sports in general seem so stratified and stratifying one wonders um if one could ever really master all the secret handshakes and uh um, cues you would need to truly be a member of the network and this is what happens to people who climb the social economic ladder all the time you know they have the kind of an imposter syndrome or they wonder if they really belong or people can are recognizing them and so on so so uh but the phenomenon you identify is a, is a common one um, what's interesting is people don't go down the ladder in quite the same way um, but that's something I think uh, is important in for the robustness of civil society is that people who golf should walk into a boxing gym uh, and um, find out how all kinds of folks live um, beyond their socioeconomic stratum. Um, but we don't do that. Sport actually doesn't foster a lot for that a lot of that, and I do neither do many other venues of civil society. So that's part of kind of the the crux of my talk and my thinking about sport. Thank you. We might that, come back that, to, to your other questions, Rick. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, so Marion, who was next? Um, sorry, we had uh, John 
um, had some questions as well, uh, John Delaney, and um, also Daniel. So probably John came online first. So John's got some uh, questions to ask. Hey, Mike, over to you. If you have, want to ask your questions. I I didn't ask any. Uh, I I can hurry and think of something. <laughs> no. Go ahead and 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 whoever you have next, Tristan. I I made a couple of comments, but they were directed to Rick. Okay, sure. So, Marion, who was next? Probably uh, Daniel. Okay, Daniel, would you like to ask yours? Uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever people are from. Uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I, I posted something in the chat box that's uh, uh, maybe a comment and a question. Uh, uh, as you described the uh, 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 boxing as a sociability and a, a vertical uh, 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 rising opportunity for kids in high poverty areas, uh, that really resonates with me because I've led a program like that for the last 45 years. Uh, for kids in Chicago, um, the uh, I, I think you uh, uh, ended your comment saying uh, such spaces aren't very prevalent. Uh, and my question was, uh, uh, and then Sophia uh, or Sabine talked about where she was and uh, was kind of talking about a similar type spaces. Uh, are you aware of people who are uh, uh, aggregating information about such? opportunities uh, so that that provides uh, 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 fodder that other people can use to build such programs? Uh, that would be uh, the first part of the question. The, the second is that uh, I'm connected to researchers who study mentoring uh, here in the United States, uh, but I don't find many who talk about it as a form of social capital and, and who are studying it in terms of uh, 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 bringing people together and keeping them together uh, 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 for a long time as part of an effort to expand who you know uh, uh, for kids uh, in poverty. So are, are you, uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, you, it sounds like uh, you, you're familiar with the struggle to get the resources to build and sustain such programs. Um, are you uh, aware of any efforts to, uh, to champion that in a larger scale? There is one in particular, it's a, there's a gym in Detroit, a boxing gym um, for youth. It's a youth gym, but it's also a competitive gym. And uh, I know that they've set up a kind of model where they provide, they require an hour's worth of tutoring, school tutoring each day. So you train for an hour and a half or whatever it is, but you can't leave the gym without doing an hour's worth of maths or sciences or whatever. And, you know, clearly bundling um, different types of opportunities into uh, a boxing club or any, any sport really um, is going to have a kind of a multiplier effect uh, on the, the kids especially. And so this is, this is something I've become aware of lately and I'm, I'm starting to kind of look into. Uh, it's exceptionally uncommon uh, and uh, it also costs money and boxing gyms on good days don't generate a lot of money. Uh, they don't have the type of cohort that can usually pay even membership dues um, beyond a very minimal amount. So, so but I, I do think there is a place for that. Uh, and I do think there are um, ways to be creative in um, providing services beyond sport and opportunities beyond sport within the venue of sociability within the site. Um, and so I think that's, I find that a, a rich normative um, uh, uh, kind of empirical and normative um, uh, development. Uh, as far as mentoring goes, you know, every coach is a mentor in one way or another. So sport is a, is a great, place for mentoring relationships to flourish. It's also a place where they can be abused and we all are aware of many, many cases like that. Um, what I find interesting in some of the work I'm doing is kind of identifying cross-racial, cross-economic, what you, I guess you call it vert vertical mentoring um, to use the terminology I'm, I'm talking about. So 
what we want is, you know, folks, unlike other folks, interacting and providing mentorship and peer relationships. And so, you know, sport is a sport is a place for that. And I think it's that does make it unique and that does give it some potential for social capital development that you're not going to see in in a lot of other venues of civil society where you're just simply not going to be able to manage a lot of that. Um, I, I, I really I, I put my, my blog address uh, in the chat box because that, that idea of vertical mentoring, that's exactly what uh, uh, I've been focusing on and, and, and what we did. Uh, uh, we created a, a, a safe space that uh, uh, kids could come uh, and as an attractive volunteer from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, and in that space, uh, uh, each kid had a one on one mentor that they met with weekly, uh, sometimes for many years. Uh, but other volunteers came in and began to say, let's set up a technology club or let's set up a video club or let's mm -hmm. have a writing club. So we, we created activities that were interesting for kids and that attracted volunteers. And uh, uh, all of those things uh, uh, were a form of uh, uh, bridging social capital and they, 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 they attracted kids to say places uh, that are safer than where they might be otherwise. Uh, uh, I'm connected now on Facebook to kids that were part of our program as early as the 1970s. And I'm seeing them now uh, talking about their own kids who have finished high school and are going on to college. So the, the long-term potential impact uh, uh, is huge. Uh, the challenges of funding such programs, uh, uh, as you said, are also huge. It's also very hard to get data. So this is the other thing. It's very hard to get data on that kind of stuff. So. You know, a lot of social capital um, research and study and funding is dependent on data. Surveys are great. You can get a lot of data, but they don't capture anything like what we're talking about right now. No, because it's long term. I mean, the, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the, the just building a program, uh, building participation, uh, uh, keeping participation for multiple years uh, is, is a difficult thing to do. Uh, uh, tracking those kids and the volunteers who are involved for 10, 20, or 30 years in the future. Uh, uh, you know, the, the donors that were giving us money 25 years ago uh, uh, were really uh, investing in outcomes that we wouldn't see for a long time. And, and right. frankly, it doesn't, it, didn't, it doesn't work for every kid. Sure, and then also not uh, particularly easy to measure. In any straight no, order. no, there, there aren't any there aren't any short term uh, uh, measures of uh, uh, how much change occurred in uh, this or that or something else. Uh, 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 there's uh, Chapin Hall uh, at the University of Chicago did a study back in the uh, early '90s that they talked about uh, 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 two types of, of uh, social service. There was the uh, uh, that, that was that which was trying to fix a problem that had already occurred and that which was trying to prevent the problem from occurring in, in the first place, you know, uh, uh, primary services and preventive. And uh, most of social service money is trying to fix a problem when it's out of the bag, uh, which, and the, so the research is, can we measure how much that problem was fixed, rather than if you think of the problem as poverty or concentrated poverty, uh, then that's a condition that kids are living in. Now, how do you grow up to, overcome those problems so that you don't have to uh, uh, raise your own kids in the same circumstances. So you, you really have to believe in, in what the process is and be able to look at indicators that a program is designed uh, to achieve that type of result. Yeah, right. And I would just add um, another term that I've, I've used and I think is helpful in this context is um, social poverty. So the kind of people you're talking about, the kids, these are kids who also live not just in material forms of poverty, but social poverty. They lack the types of networks to move up and down the uh, socioeconomic la ladder. In I mean, it, 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 yeah, poverty is a, is a oneness. It's, 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 a, it's a bonding form of social capital because it's, it's people like yourself that in many ways reinforces that behavior. Uh, uh, and unless you uh, uh, are able to bring in other influences, uh, changing the aspirations kids might have, nothing changes. Thank you, I appreciate that. 
It seems like a, in any social field, there's the opportunity perhaps for, for sociability to occur, for there to be these kind of horizontal and, and vertical forms of sociability. But often it doesn't happen. But I think in many of these situations, it, it can happen. And, and whether it does or doesn't perhaps comes down to a lot of it, to the, to the values of the participants, the people involved. Um, and with some of the work that I've done, you know, looking at barriers to participation, say, you know, in, in basic economic development type of activities, especially in developing countries, uh, quite often it can be really simple things like the type of language that's used within the group can be a barrier for people getting involved, you know, technical language or the use of acronyms can be a real challenge for people. And they might feel like they don't belong because they don't understand what these things are. And so, you know, I think that there's, there's scope for a lot of these social fields to, to um, be more engaging with people and allow people to participate more. And so even though few of these um, sporting groups perhaps, you know, are areas of vertical sociability, they, perhaps they can be. I would agree. Um, you, it takes a self-conscious kind of effort on the part of the, whoever's managing it, or and or the participants. The only kind of caveat I have is if it's too forced or too artificial, and you've probably seen this in your work, people will kind of smell a rat, as we say. And and it's very, especially with youth, then it's very hard to steer it back in the direction you want. And it's you basically lost the group. Absolutely. It really is about perception and interpretation rather than, than what it is that you're actually saying. And, it, and you can't, you can't fake it just like you can't fake building, a, you know, a meaningful relationship with somebody, you know, that very instrumental form of networking that people sometimes engage in. It just doesn't work. You might get their business card, you might make a contact, but it, it doesn't have any value because everyone can smell a rat. So I completely agree with what you're saying. I call it a, in my work, I call it a sense of we a sense of we yeah I like that that's what you're trying you're trying to cultivate a sense of we which is a little different than group or there's something unique about a sense of we it's a kind of two to tango concept you know it doesn't matter if someone's skin color or class or privilege if we're going to tango we have to be a we there's no tango of one and it seems like it's on that sort of value system level that change needs to occur for us to effectively improve social capital yeah. Uh, so I think the next question was from Polychronos. Uh, in, from, he's from Greece. Uh, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, or would you prefer me to ask it on your behalf? I give a shot. <laughs> okay. Go for Hello, it. everybody. Thank you, Professor Lewandowski. Uh, depending on the social profile of sports, there is a corresponding social background concerning the masses of people involved. Uh, can this be seen as a dimension of social capital that can be bridged, like Putnam bridging uh, approach? Or does it reinforce existing uh, fixed social distinctions and perceptions like Bourdieu and Marxism? Also, if you can uh, relate it to horizontal or vertical sociability you mentioned. Thank you. So I think if I understand the correct question correctly, you're asking about whether or not these um, these sporting forms uh, can what 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 makes it what's the determining factor in whether or not they kind of foster bridging or bonding or uh, or vertical or horizontal is that is that kind of the general thrust of the question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think part of it goes to what, what Tristan was saying and what we were talking about before. So some, some sports, by the nature of the sport, can kind of organically open, lend themselves to vertical sociability. So the one I've been looking at is boxing. Um, it, it doesn't simply draw one type of ethno-racial group. Now, it's horizontal and it's kind of working class socioeconomic proletariat dimensions, but in terms of eth ethnicity and race, um, the sport seems to draw people who are used to working with their bodies and have a certain relationship to physical labor, um, but it's not tied to race the way that say um, race car driving is in the US here or fencing might be. Um, it seems to, seems to be, um, uh, ethno-racially diverse uh, magnet. So if you have a sport or a venue like that, 
um, then you have a, already a natural um, pull for diversification of a community and a broader sense of we. Um, then from then, you know, it can kind of happen through the nature of um, complex forms of social interaction, whether it's sparring or training and so on in a, in a boxing gym or any other sporting venue that lends itself to this type of sociability, this kind of vertical one. But we said already, most sports are not like that. So then the only other way to do it is through either youth sport um, and then intentionally, self-consciously. Um, so I guess that would mean kind of reaching out to marketing or situating the sporting venue in a um, in an area that is accessible to many types of groups and many people from many walks of life and also has um, no significant economic barriers. I mean, that to me would be the kind of the, the starting point for, for producing vertical social capital and minimizing or lessening social poverty is either self-consciously um, or by kind of drawing on the natural affinities of, of a select number of sports. So soccer, football, I would say is another one in the category. You know, you look at the favelas in Brazil, um, places all over the world, it doesn't take anything economically to play soccer. Uh, you can make a ball out of um, several socks balled up. You don't need shoes. And you have yourself a pitch wherever you're standing and you're, you're good. So, you know, you can, you in sports that don't have a high cost dimension to them or don't have a historical, um, uh, a history or a historical, have not been historically shaped by ethno-racial division, such as bowling. Bowling is probably the, the, the worst one to select um, or one of. Um, those then, you know, seem like um, promising, promising um, avenues. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a comment in the chat from Jay Riverside. It wasn't really a question. Uh, Jay Riverside, did you want to talk to that at all, or should we move on? Well, it was just I was just making a point about how football has a greater effect in Mexico than in other uh, soccer. I mean, soccer, for uh, not to be confused with uh, America football. But in Mexico, we have traced at least in a couple of municipalities, the way the, the winning of the local teams uh, uh, reduces violence within the household. So I think it's in a way, it, it's a way of measuring about this, the social capital aspect of the sport, I think. And so I, that's, I was, that was my, my point, basically, not, not exactly as a question. Tristan, thank you. Thank you, that's Professor. Thank you, that's interesting. If I could follow up, what, what do you think is the, what, what, what produces that correlation uh, more specifically? Is it just a more general satisfaction with the locals based on the performance of the club? Or what, what would, what would, because uh, sometimes when fans- Actually it's a correlation, we, we find that, we found out that there's also an inverse correlation. When the, the, the team loses, the, the household violence increases. And, mm -hmm. and somehow we, I think it's a, some sort of frustration, local frustration, collective frustration. Basically, when they reach the semifinals or the final, and then they they end up um, losing the, the 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 ultimate challenge of winning. And uh, in a way, we, we're related to to drug cartel uh, uh, activities within the cities. It's, it's somehow it's, it's a mix. If you, I will let you know about these studies when we have. A, view, a, a bigger picture on that. It has been for four or five years since we have a tendency to lower increases in, in violence. And some of my colleagues from the faculty are, are the ones trying to do this, this study. I would love to share it with you if you allow me to. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I would appreciate that. I'd really like to see that. And I'm also interested in, in, in violence kind of in sport, sport violence but then also kind of violence clustered around sport, whether it's kind of the audience um, or fan-based. Uh, so yeah, or even in kind of the wider community. Uh, so yeah, I'd really appreciate seeing that, thank you. 
There might be some lessons as well coming from psychology about, uh, you know, anger being often a, a secondary emotion. And so the, the team losing might be a frustration that then can lead to basically anger, depending on other life circumstances that are occurring. So I think, you know, psychology perhaps can, can add quite a bit to this conversation. So, uh, Joyce, a couple of things that have come up in the in the chat. Um, one is, would you be willing to, to share your PowerPoint slides with the participants? Yes, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So if you send them to me, I'll be able to on-send them easily to everyone who registered for this session. And there's also Happy a question, uh, whether you're on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, I am not, uh, but I did put my email and website uh, on the home, uh, the first page of the PowerPoint, and I'm happy to, to um, connect with anyone. Uh, my work, uh, a good selection of my work is available, can be downloaded for free on the website too. So, but I'm also happy to send people things uh, if they can't get them. Uh, I'm very much committed to the conversation and to social capital research. And I've basically always tried to, to write for users. So I want people to be able to take and operationalize, improve and then operationalize any of this material. So yes, absolutely. Oh, thanks, Joseph. Very generous. Um, I think we're pretty well out of time. Do we have time for one final question? Uh, if, so, if so, Rick, do you want to ask one of your other questions? And then we'll, we'll finish up there. Sure. So one of the other things, uh, you had made comments particularly around um, white um, Americans pulling away from the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it seems like for me, just visually seeing, it seems like it's happened since the current administration took over. And my question was just around, do you think that this shift to a primarily democratic administration, you know, the voting is over, Republicans lost, you know, Trump is gone, you know, from, from the spotlight. That, that maybe white liberal America has found less quote unquote capital in associating with this Black Lives Matter movement? I think that could be part, I'm just speculating here, that could be part of it. I think also, you know, um, social movements kind of, when they crop up, they sometimes have a certain fashionability and a certain um, allure to them. And especially if they're kind of cross-racial or, or whatever dominant groups, sometimes like to build their um, portfolio, as it were, or kind of associating with these. And then, you know, they run out of steam um, for various reasons and they end up uh, no longer participating, only weakly participating. This happens in uh, school reform movements in the US. Um, it happens in uh, other community, community movements, uh, land development, all kinds of things, you know oppressed and marginalized groups will initiate the movement. Um, they'll get buy-in from a dominant group of some kind. Um, that will give the movement an additional kind of um, uh, cr critical mass and power, uh, but they exit. The, 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 um, the commitment's not there. And uh, for whatever reason, um, their exit uh, tends to coincide with the lessening of the effectiveness of the, the movement. Um, and uh, that's, I think that's something you see repeatedly and not just in the US in many, many societies uh, where, where the dominant group or members of the dominant group um, find it convenient and get a kind of a normative halo, shall we say, from associating and participating, but it's really kind of uh, superficial um, and not built to not built to last, not a genuine commitment. This is something the black community has uh, complained about white America for for a very long time. Nothing new. Thank you for your willingness to take on such a sensitive question. I really appreciate it. Sure. All right, well, let's uh, wrap up there. Thanks very much, Joseph, for your time. We really appreciate you putting the effort in to, to prepare this presentation and make yourself available for, for so many questions. I'm aware a few questions we didn't get to in the chat. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have time for that. Um, next our webinar is actually on the 7th of January. We, we've finished the webinar series for 2021. Um, in January, the next presentation will be by uh, Professor Sandra Rosas on analysis of the determinants of social capital in organizations, which I think will be a, a really interesting uh, presentation. Hope you can join us then. I'll end the recording now, um, but feel free to stay on if you want to have some informal discussion afterwards.